And may we take to heart the idea of peace that Christ brings, and may we be willing to give it away in this season. At this time, I'd like to ask Jessica Parsley, the Haddon children, and Chris Stanley to come up and light the candle of peace. For us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of the government and peace. There will be no end to his reign on David's throne, and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Lily May is going to pray, and then Belle is going to end it. See? See Dear God, thank you for having us here. Happy birthday. Dear God, Did you for a family and happy birthday. <laughs> Amen. Right. Good, job. Good morning. Normally about this time in the first service we're gonna start singing our praise set. We're gonna do a little bit of different this year. It's Christmas time, so we're gonna do some Christmas carols instead. So if we can get the praise team to come on up, and you guys can go ahead and stand up with us, and we can go ahead and get some singing in.
Welcome to church this morning, y'all. You might be able to tell from behind me, but it's Christmas time. Who's excited? Me? A couple people? Well, I'm just glad to see a whole so many people here for our first service, especially on a, on a day that's going to get kind of gross with the, with the weather. Uh, we need it, but that's okay. Um, if you're here with us and aren't reg- a regular attendee, if you could, um, in the pew rack in front of you, there's a little white card, a little index card. If you could fill that out, drop it in the offering plate or give it to any of the deacons, we'd really appreciate it. It gives us the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better and get to share with you a little bit about us. Um, Please take a look into the bulletin. There's a lot going on. Um, There might be a kids' production this afternoon at 5.30. Um, But there's one thing that, and this is my fault, I didn't ask for it to get put in the bulletin, but my family's got to praise my grandmother on Friday turned 100 years old. <clears throat> so, thank you. Uh, she, you know, she's kicking as much as you can for a 100-year-old. She had a party for her on a Saturday. She had a great time. Um, all right, now, kids, I need you guys to earmuff for this next part. I'm going to talk about Christmas presents a little bit, okay? So, in case your parents like my idea. But, you know, it's getting kind of late, Chris, you know, with it being so close. If you haven't already gotten your kids stuff, I've got a great idea for a Christmas present. Get them a broken drum. It's expensive. It's good on so many levels, though. Got to be frank. All right, so above, above and beyond that, I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you for coming out, and we're going to move on to Pastor Frank. And Tripp, you just can't be beat either. That's a hard act to follow. One announcement before we begin our prayer time. Uh, The children uh, for children's worship will be dismissed immediately after you sing this morning. So just make that known as you're prepared to do that. We have praises and we have prayers. And today we're so happy to announce the birth of Collins Thomas Moore. Uh, Collins, uh, there's a rose over here for Collins. He came to this world on Tuesday, six pounds, 14 ounces, 19 inches. And we're just so happy for Katie and Ryan, the parents. They were married earlier this year and they didn't waste any time. So here Collins is. And we're just so happy, too, for the extended family. We remember Pam and Wayne Kennedy as grandparents. And, of course, Francis and Danny Kennedy, great-grandparents. We also want to think about those who are remembering loved ones. I know this time of the year can be difficult. We remember those who perhaps have passed away in this season. But here recently... We lost Maurice Hawkins. Maurice passed away about 1 in the morning, I guess was the official time on Friday. And uh, just, if you will, be in prayer for his family, particularly his uh, three daughters, as we think about uh, Leslie and, and uh, Terry and also uh, Kendra. Two of them live here, and he had been staying with Leslie in South Carolina. But Maurice meant a lot to us the time that he was here. He had left Greenwood United Methodist Church. He saw the light and he came to Baptist. Actually, I think he went to Greenwood for the sake of his wife. Uh, He became a Methodist for a while and back to the Baptist Church. But let's do remember that family. Also, Eugene Burke and his family in the death of his sister, Bambi Richardson, who passed away on Wednesday, his older sister, And we just want to remember Eugene and all of the family at this time of loss and bereavement. It is always difficult to say goodbye to our loved ones. Today, we also want to draw your attention, if you will, um, on page six in the bulletin. You'll see the prayers for our world. One of those is for our sort of adopted missionaries, if you will, Mina and Gennady Podgaisky. And let's pray for their traveling safety. They'll leave this coming Friday. 
coming back to the States. They've been through so much, and the next time they come, I know they will have much to share with us in light of what's been happening in that part of the world. Also, we want to be remembering those here within the congregation and those connected as we think about uh, Daryl Collins, Patsy's husband, hospitalized and has had a lot of issues with his breathing. Let's pray for him. And Lee Forbus, uh, Lee did get home Friday, so that's a note to make, a change from the bulletin. He got home Friday afternoon, and let's pray for him and Ardell there as he recovers. And let's not forget Peggy Jack, good friend of uh, Wanda Journey, continuing to get to rehab at Sheltering Arms. In terms of what's happened this week and this coming to happen this coming week, Betty Elam is scheduled to have a full knee replacement surgery on Tuesday, and Wayne King is to have Moe's surgery on his nose this Thursday. We uh, rejoice that Libby Goen has now gotten through both of her cataract surgeries well. She is anticipating a surgery for hiatal hernia on January the 5th, so it just doesn't stop for Libby. And we want to continue to pray for Bobby as well and his strength. Jean Hall, uh, for her strength, she had a little fainting episode earlier this week. We pray that the things, everything went well for the Keaton Estate sale. I know they were heavily involved with that. Josephine Mason, who is now had been, was approved on Thursday to go into hospice care in the home. So let's remember Wendy Houston, the daughter who's caring for her, along with other family, uh, Wes Mason, of course, and his brother Keith Mason. Let's remember all of them at this time. And then the extended family, some of the siblings of Josephine who are here at our church. Uh, Mike Parsley, who's scheduled to see another eye doctor tomorrow. Let's pray for Mike and his vision. We praise God that uh, Lynn Perkins got through her um, pacemaker implantation on Thursday. We pray for her uh, heart rate to be regular now. And then Kathy Solomon, who's having a couple of procedures coming up on Tuesday, uh, including, um, I believe, a mammogram and then followed by an ultrasound, 3D ultrasound. Let's pray for her peace as she goes into that. And then Renee uh, uh, Muller, let's pray for her, Rod and Ruth Conkle's daughter. She's uh, been diagnosed with cancer. And Brad Porter, we're grateful that he got through his surgery. This is Barbara's son. He got through his leg tumor surgery on Monday. And let's pray for his healing, and let's pray for a very favorable prognosis for him. And I wanted to let you know, sadly, one of the names listed in here and was put on email the other day, Mary Jo Hopkins, a very good friend with Paige Green and his family, a good family friend for years. Uh, she passed away, um, and uh, she, she died on, let's see, Saturday, early Saturday morning yesterday. And Paige told me this morning that they're anticipating the funeral service to be this Thursday and Paige will be assisting with that service, so let's remember him. I know that's going to be a tough assignment for you, Paige, um, having been a part of services before where it was someone very close to you. I know that's a difficult task and a tall order, but we pray for all of you this time of loss and bereavement. Again, so many to be remembering here, and I'd like for you to join me in a moment of prayer, and then our children and our youth will bless us. Father, we thank you for this gathering this morning. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house for worship. We do pray for your perfect peace, Lord. It passes all of our understanding. We realize that this is a time in which there is much unrest. There is anxiety. It seems that there's anything but peace in our hearts and perhaps in the in hearts of others and whom we know and love and we know they're struggling and certainly in our world. But we also know, Lord, that you have told us through your Son, Jesus the Christ, that he gives us his peace, your peace, not like the world gives, but his peace. And we thank you, Father, for allowing this to take place, first of all, by the giving of your one and only Son, bringing Jesus into this world as a baby, Lord, as we think about Collins and other newborns, 
we think about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came into the world in the very same fashion. It, it's hard to embrace or even begin to fathom the magnitude of that, that the very Savior of the world came as one of us. So we thank you, Father, for Emmanuel. And Lord, today, as we worship you, may our hearts be fixed upon you. May our minds be focused upon thee. And Lord, we do ask again that you bless each and every one for whom we're praying. You know them all. And Father, help us to be refraining from our own sinning. We have fallen so short. We ask for your forgiveness as we confess our sins before you. And Lord, today, may this be the beginning of a wonderful second week of Advent that we indeed share the peace that you have given us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. Tori.
Heavenly Father, we are grateful indeed for our children, our youth, and what they mean to you and to our church here at Hunton. It's amazing to watch them grow and learn. And we're thankful, Lord, that they're singing and they're proclaiming the good news. May we all take a lesson from that and share the good news with others. Not only with our speech, but with our monetary gifts. And so we take this time now to give back to you, Lord, in this offertory. I pray, Father, that every tithe and offering today will be used to further your kingdom and all that is needed in this world. It seems that we live in a dark and, and dismal world and how we need to share the good news with others. And this is a great way in which we can help to do that. So we thank you again, and I pray that we will give today sacrificially and joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Play. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. May it be so. So right before the, the surgery, the surgeon says, relax, Jim. Relax. It's just a small scalpel incision, Jim. No reason to panic. The patient replies, but doctor, my name is not Jim. And the surgeon says, I know, my name is Jim. <laughs> we do panic at times. That's where we begin today. Reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. And this account, of course, comes in the, right in the midst of Jesus' ministry here on this earth and all the things that he was dealing with, including the instruction as best he could to the disciples. So on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him, Jesus, with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But as he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, 
Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? The reading of God's word and how we learn so much by it and from it and as this second Sunday of Advent is upon us now, we do turn to that theme of peace and how oftentimes we're searching for that peace in the midst of the panics of life. Today I want to do the best I can to lead us down the path to that peace. You know, as Mark relays this account here, the disciples, they're, of course, on a boat. The sudden and violent storm comes up. You've probably seen a storm blow in, maybe here or at the beach or at the river. Some of you perhaps have even felt a storm coming in. There's a cave in South Dakota, huge one called Jewel Cave, and there you ride an elevator and you go 100 or maybe 200 feet below the surface to the cave. That's how you arrive. There are glass doors you have to open to go into the cave when you get down there. And when the park ranger opens the door, wind rushes out the door. He explains that the cave always tries to match the atmospheric pressure of the outside. So if air is rushing out, it's trying to get rid of pressure, which means a low pressure system is moving in and it is going to rain or storm. If the air is rushing in the cave, it means the cave is trying to match the high pressure from on the way and it would mean hopefully nice weather. Interesting as we think about the storms literally and figuratively, figuratively of life. You see, many of the disciples, a good number of them, had spent most of their vocational time on the sea as fishermen. That was their vocation. If a storm was coming, when Jesus suggested going to the other side of the sea, they would have probably said, ah, oh, I see a storm coming. I feel a storm blowing in. Maybe we should wait. Now Matthew, in his account, tells us that it was a sudden storm. Mark here simply says a great storm. I would guess that it was sudden because you see, many of life's storms are sudden. Hearing a doctor say you have cancer is a sudden storm. When a spouse is caught being unfaithful, it's a sudden storm. We're sorry, but your job has been eliminated, terminated. There's been a wreck. There's been an accident at work. Sudden storms. And what do we do in many of these cases? First sermon point today. Panic. Panic. Perhaps we throw up a desperate prayer. A, a panic prayer, if you will. Just as, as the disciples did to the one who could help. Teacher, do you not care if we perish? When we throw up a panic prayer, we can be sure that God does not share our panic. Okay? God does not share our panic. God doesn't get surprised. I don't ever picture God sitting there saying... Wow, I never saw that coming. God may show pity on us. God probably feels for us as we panic and worry, but God does not panic and worry. One commentary says, 
we do ill to try to communicate our despair to God. Instead of rushing to communicate our panic to him, we should allow him to communicate his calm to us. A mother became hysterical with panic. And she did so because her little boy had swallowed a coin. She turned to her husband and screamed for him to call 911. The husband picked up the phone, but instead of calling emergency, he decided to call their church treasurer. Bruce Solomon, here. The wife was upset and said, we don't need the church treasurer. We need some medical help. To which the husband replied, my dear, I assure you, the church treasurer can get money out of anyone. But what was the wife and mother worrying about? The same thing Jesus' disciples were panicked about. Point number two, peril. Peril. We go from panic to peril. Don't you care if we perish? They, they screamed, if you will, at Jesus upon awakening him. Now consider the irony of this question. Don't you care? They said that to Jesus. Don't you care? Jesus cares more than anyone else in the world. The disciples were addressing the one who cared above all. Their panic had escalated to a perilous situation. Have you been there? Have you done that? William Marshall shared a story about facing your fears. For several years, a woman had been having trouble getting to sleep at night. And it was because she feared burglars. One night, her husband heard a noise in the house, so he went downstairs with gun in hand to investigate. When he got there, he did find a burglar. It wasn't weather tech or people like that. It was a burglar. Good evening, said the man of the house. His gun pointed at the burglar. I am actually pleased to see you. Come upstairs and meet my wife. She's been waiting 10 years to meet you. The man of the house stayed calm and in control. Oh, so like Jesus. Sometimes you meet people who have found that calm. The, that peace that surpasses all understanding. So that whether the storm is calmed or whether the storm rages, they will have no fear. Why? Because God is with them. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 through 13, that he had learned the secret of facing the storms. He says that no matter what, he can make it through Christ. He can get through it with Christ. He said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The very strength of God was exhibited by our Savior, Jesus. We see his, point number three, power. Power, we see his power. By his power, Jesus rebuked the wind. Can you imagine having the power to rebuke the tornadic winds? Some of those we may get this evening. God has the power to rebuke the storms of our lives. There is no limit to his mighty power. Jesus had been given that power, and he had, he had that power even while he was asleep. We're reminded in the scriptures 
that God does not slumber, nor does he sleep. He's always there with and for us in every situation of life. No matter what you're going through this day, no matter what, the Lord is there and he's ready to help you. For he is the most powerful force of all. Perhaps even in this time, this Advent season, you've been down. Even panicking about something in your life that seems at times almost perilous. Remember the power of God. The power of the one to whom we pray. Focus on that and him. Have you ever had an appliance that didn't work? You know, maybe it, was, it wasn't that old. It's pretty new. It should still be working. No matter what you tried, you, you could not get it to operate. And then once you've gotten sufficiently frustrated, you decide, well, I'm going to call a friend and see if he can come over and give me some help. Now, I want you to be honest with me. How many of you have had your friend point out that the machine was unplugged? Forgot to plug it in. Oh, knew there was something. If you ever had had this experience, then no doubt you can appreciate the importance of power in a real and sometimes embarrassing way. How well do we trust God's saving power in our lives? Luke Aikens is a professional skydiver who jumped from 25,000 feet without a parachute. He spent two years preparing to perform this stunt. He completely trusted the specially constructed net to catch him in a manner that would not cause him injury. Dramatically, Aiken successfully landed in the net and walked away without a scratch. Well, I want to tell you today, friends, we have a safety net greater than that. The one who has all the power in the world and out of this world and the real beauty is that God's power leads to our, number four, peace. Peace. By the way, aren't you impressed with me? Very short points. They all begin with P, five letters. How hard is that to do? I don't normally focus on that, but I just thought about it. <laughs> yes. I want to say yes. We receive at Christmas and year-round peace from the Prince of Peace. The one whom Levi read about this morning. In the case of the disciples, Jesus calmed the storm. If he had not, it would not have been because he didn't care. Christ is with you even when the worst storms of this life batter against your ship, even if your ship goes down. Even when the cancer is fatal, we will not perish if we have Christ. Oh, what an important conditional word that little word if is. If we have Christ, we will not perish though we die. We can't ever ask Jesus if he cares if we're perishing. He has already shown us he doesn't want us to perish. He died on the cross to keep us from perishing. 
He did all that was necessary to make sure when our ship goes down, when our earthly lives end, that we do not perish. Pat Wallen's earthly life ended 12 days ago. Our brother Henry, Hank, knows oh so well the grief that comes with that. But even though her earthly life ended, she did not perish. Henry and all of Pat's family can have peace because she claimed Christ with her. Pat said she accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross. She spent much of her life being the hands of and the feet of Christ. We only perish if we don't have Christ with us. And it's not that he doesn't want to be with us. He died for each of us in our place. When you die, and you will, I will, the decision you made or didn't make about accepting and living a life for Christ will decide if you perish. Jesus has the power to save you and the peace you need for the journey. Missionary Don Richardson, who served for many years among the primitive tribes in New Guinea, he wrote a book entitled The Peace Child. He tells the story of two tribes in New Guinea who maintained a blood feud between themselves for several generations. Each generation fought and nursed their wounds only to fight again, killing and maiming more and more and more people. After years of struggle, the two tribes realized that they must stop fighting or nothing would be left of these people. But what could they do to end years of warring between the two tribes? Richard goes on to tell that the chiefs of the two tribes came together and they brought with them a child they called the peace child. This child was the son of one of the opposing chiefs which was adopted into the family of the other opposing chief. As long as that child lived, the two chiefs promised to cease their fighting so that all could live. What an appropriate picture of God's love for us in sending his son, the prince of peace, to die for us. Unlike Jesus knowing that the disciples would be okay, we know just the opposite. The lost and the unreached in the world will not be okay. As good of a person as he or she may be, Without Christ, they will not be okay. This is our evangelistic appeal with which I close. These people must be told about Jesus. They must be. They must be told they are perishing. We must tell them saying, I care that you are perishing. Watch out, you will certainly perish if you keep going that way. They don't have to perish. We know who keeps us from perishing. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. We must tell them.
that Jesus saves. His very name says it, one who saves. We must let them know they are perishing and Jesus is the lifeline. 4.5 billion, billion people in the world are living without Christ. And 1 billion have never heard the name Jesus. They're not coming into the church. No, we have to go and reach them. We have to get out there. Here we are asleep on our comfy pillows knowing we're safe and I guess that's all that matters. Well, I hate to get you out of your comfort zone, but that's not all that matters. That's a praise. Praise God and that's why we come here on Sundays. So what would the Prince of Peace have you to do this day, this second week of Advent? Tell everyone you encounter about the one who cares and about the one who has the power to bring peace. Tell them about the one who saves. Let us pray now in his name. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, help us to realize more than we ever have before the importance, number one, of living a life that trusts you through times of panic and even perilous times the one who has all the power and ultimately the one and only one who can give us true peace. But Lord, may it not even stop there, but those of us already in Christ, may we realize that others are without him, so many. Perhaps today there will be one or more here who is ready to make that decision to say yes to Jesus. Yes to your son, our Savior. He's already done the work. He died once for all. He's not having to come and come again and die again, anything like that. It's finished. It's complete. But Father, it's not the end of the story because... The ultimate will of God is that, that of your will, Lord, is that none perish. May we have a strong part in the ultimate welfare of those who have not yet accepted that greatest gift of all. May this season be the time we begin with all fervor to make Christ known. In his precious, holy, perfect name, we pray. Amen. We are going to close our service today with a, a song. It's actually a good carol, hymn, Silent Night. You know, I think about that. I think about so many things in the scriptures that refer to peace. That one, of course, uh, what is it? Sleep in heavenly peace. Yeah, think about that. As a baby, Jesus was sleeping. He was sleeping on the boat. But he was also the Prince of Peace at all those times. He wants to give us that peace. And the only way we're going to have true peace is to receive him in our hearts. And we can know all, a lot about him, read the scriptures in our minds. But we have to receive him here. Make it real. To say, yes, Lord, I realize you are my Savior. I want to make you the Lord of my life. And so if there's anyone who needs to make a decision today in that regard, please don't hesitate. There may be one or more who are ready to join with us here at Hunton as we had a
couple of dear ones to do last week with Ken Cambry and Tucci Metcalf. And uh, we're just uh, so excited about those who want to join with us at Hunton to do the very best we can to share Jesus with all. Maybe today is a time when you even silently, you don't have to come forward, certainly, but just in your own mind and heart, just say, Father, Father God, help me to be your instrument of peace and help me to share the love that Jesus has for me and share that with everyone and let them know by my life and by my words. Whatever your decision needs to be, you make it known today. Another great ending to another wonderful service today. Thank you for your prayers for all of those who are on the verge of making decisions for the Lord. Well, this morning we have these two young ladies who've come forward. First, we have, uh, I believe it's Abigail Nicole, isn't it? Abigail, she goes by Abby. Abby. And then Brianna Lynn. Okay, Brianna. Let's see. Last name is Dean. This is their dad, Rob. Most of you know Rob. And Mother Lauren is out here. Couldn't hold back the tears. But we were so excited when they had made that private confession of faith and now making this public. And we're just thrilled. Um, we look forward to baptizing you. If it's okay, I'd love to do that on Christmas Eve morning. Christmas Eve morning. So if you can be here, I know some of you will be gone, but if you can be here, Come, and that'll be the first part of our service on what a great way to celebrate the, the season of Christmas and Christmas Eve and baptism. We have uh, three others awaiting, so hopefully, uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm opening it up here, so I'm opening up. If you want to come forward next Sunday, you can get in on the act on the 24th. So there you go. But five who uh, plan to be baptized, including, I mentioned Ken Cambry, Tucci Metcalf, and their professions of faith in Christ. And also Nolan Jones, who is nine. Let's see, Abby is 11, right? You're, and you're almost nine, aren't you, Brianna, next month? So excited we are for you all. You know, we can learn so much from our youngsters, can't we, Rob? And they can model things for us and teach us in so many ways. So I will ask if you will join me in welcoming these two wonderful girls. Uh, you would say, welcome Abby and Brianna. Welcome, Abby and Brianna. Yay. I want to make sure I don't want to shortchange anybody. I know 
Abigail has become Abby for the most part. Yes. Now, sometimes I hear you calling Brianna Bree. Right. So yes. is that how everybody knows her? Okay, so Abby and Bree, we're just so thrilled for them. I would like for y'all, if you will, and maybe Lauren, join us uh, at the back. I know everybody will want to welcome them officially uh, to the faith, shall we say, and also to the Church of Hunton in an official capacity. As we uh, have our closing prayer, y'all walk with me and we'll give you that opportunity. I do pray that God will give you a wonderful rest of the Lord's day here as we serve him. Father God, I thank you so much for your love and your care your grace and your peace. And Father, that is a peace that we cannot even begin to understand. And so now, Lord, on this second Sunday of Advent, may we focus upon not only the hope that we've learned about this past week, but the peace that comes as well. As we trust you for each and every day, knowing, Father, that you are there with us and for us in every situation. Now, as we go out into this world, wherever we are, May we proclaim your name and never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.